Come on, man. You know what to do. I don't know. Flay has taught him really weird things about what should happen right now. <laughs> there, there. Never mind. Spe speaking of the teacher of weird things. All right, we are calling all Gundam Seed pilots. Are you ready to double your deployment? Join us on Patreon and get double episodes dropped right away. Once we reach 30 patrons, we'll bring double episodes to YouTube for everybody to experience. So fuel your Gundam addiction on Patreon. So let's build this community together. Join Patreon and get those double episodes of Gundam Seed. Hey everybody, welcome back to another Stoneface Reactions. I'm Theta, this is Justin, and we are back with another episode of Gundam Seed. Uh, first off, we got a comment from the Patreon. I, yeah, Lev Freedom says, on a com, uh, sorry, from the episode On a Calm Day, and actually I'm going to parse this out real quick, because I want to read their last comment first, which is, I'm French. So it's hard to write in English, but I try my best, smiley face. I'm putting that first, so that when I read the rest, and I get a little confused along the way, we all understand what's going on here, not making fun. It's an error of traduction. I'm, maybe tradition? I think maybe that's what was meant to be said. Uh, the Enjoy Your Time Yamato by Natalie. She blushed at Kira for two reasons. Uh, because first, she wanted to call Kira by his military grade, but stop herself and tell Shodan, and then blushed. Maybe she surely felt embarrassed to call someone so casually, or she's embarrassed because she almost said out loud that Kira is from the military, and people could maybe hear that. Bad girl is maybe a shy girl inside. LOL. I'm sorry if some sort of phrasing I could say is confusing. I'm French, so it's hard to write in English, but I try my best. Uh, first off, appreciate the comment. Uh, I think it could absolutely be the, the catching herself in the revealing of military. I mean, it could be. It could be, but it reads weird. If it was that, what I would appreciate to have happened would have been she starts to say it, maybe gets like a syllable of the word out, stops, you know, you do that little line when you break a sentence, blush, and mm -hmm. then said the thing that she said. Give me an indication that she was going to say something else and then have her say the thing that makes her blush. Yeah, I can see that. Um, otherwise, I guess my only other response to the comment would be, if you're understanding this, um, and I guess a blanket statement to all commenters, go ahead and respond in your native language. It's fine. I translate everything I read from everybody else that's not responding in English. If you're talking to me directly, then I appreciate well, you know, not even then. I have conversations with people in their native languages, and I feel free to go translate it back at them. <laughs> I do the thing that you're doing. Not you, Justin. You, the commenter, are doing where I, I translate. Tell me what I'm doing. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm telling you what you're doing. You're staring <laughs> at your screen right now, or sure. just above my notepad, you're, little, so you're staring at your microphone, but whatever. Um, yeah, I have no problem if in the comment section you want to respond in your native language. I'm reading them anyway. I have no problem translating them. And to, I don't know if this comes across as insulting or not. Sometimes I understand that it's good for people to write in another language to try and get used to it if you're trying to learn it. But otherwise, if your only concern is for me to understand it or for us to understand it, Google translating has gone a long way, at least when it comes to English, that a lot of the stuff is easier to understand if it comes to Google Translate than you trying to translate it yourself. I find, anyway. So, if it's easier for you, and you want to leave a comment, just leave a comment in French, or Japanese, or um, Esperanto, <laughs> or Spanish, or whatever language you speak. I'll respond either way, and you'll get the broken 
<laughs> language as I try to push it through a, a translator program. We endorse that message here at Stoneface Reactions. It's a wide world out there. All right. How about you go ahead and give us the uh, the recap of what happened last time? Um, if I recall correctly, last time was a whole bunch of fighting uh, between mech suits. We had a couple of the actual mobile suits that were Gundams uh, enter into the fray, but they couldn't really fight that well, so they're on top of the reinforcements that were sent. And we got to see the Desert Tiger and his partner, never actually explained, versus Kira, which ended in the death of both of them. We are now headed to the Strait of Gibraltar, I believe. I mean, yeah, I think they said that was probably the only uh, passable location. Yep. We just do know they were also heading north, uh, west from wherever they were. All right. Well, I guess the first thing up is I will link you the board. Because I am going to give a description of something here in my thoughts section that is best represented with character images. Or at least this little bit here. Probably helpful if I actually bring that up on screen now that I think about that. There we go. Hey, so, the thought is, Zaft Factions. There appears yes. to be 12 seats at the council table, based on just the last uh, zoom-out shot of the chamber that we got. I've only okay. gotten the names and faces of eight of the council members so far. Got it. Uh, and specifically, I've tried to break them up into who was against and who was for and who was unknown stance on Operation Split Break, which we just heard about last time. Uh, looking at my chart here, I put nobody in the Klein column because I got no fucking idea who would be on Klein's side. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, on Zala's side, we know Ali Kasim uh, is with him. Uh, Luis Leitner is with him. Only because this is the shots I have of them right here are literally yeah. them standing on either side of him during the during the announcement. So yes, that is his shoulder right there, and that is his other shoulder right there. Yes. Uh, and then Yuri uh, Amalfi right here, which is you know uh, the dad of one of our pilots, the green-haired kid. Yep. Uh, otherwise, we also know. Uh, we don't know the status of Herman Gould, Azalia, Jewel, or Aline Canaver. Uh, Azalia, Jewel, and Aline Canaver seem to be on the same side, but not sure what side that is. Uh, the fact that the operation won the vote already tells us that the majority were on Zala's side politically. Uh, we yes. saw Yuri talk it out with his family, why Zala made sense, and Luis Nali backing Zala during his speech. I think the safe thing would be to just consider everyone on the council to be in Zala's camp until proven otherwise. Yep. Uh, Rao even suggests that Zala will go on to replace Klein as chairman in the next elections. At the same time, talking about a real Operation Split Break, implying that the one we know nothing about is already fake. Yes. And since we got the board up here already, let's go ahead and here we have um, Nicole's mom, Yuri's wife, down yep. here on the bottom. I don't know. Did I add anything else? Obviously, Waltfield and Aisha are dead. Yep. The Lessips escaped with uh, DaCosta. So, as far as we know, still around, still alive. Costa will probably be a uh, problem down the road. I don't know. As far as we know, he got told to go back to the uh, little, little capital encampment of the area. So he could just be a regional thing. You know, if he takes command of that position and they're going off to Gibraltar or wherever. Yeah, that's right. Gibraltar. Awesome. Sorry, if in my head it sounded wrong. I was like, no way, it's a straight of Gibraltar. That is right, Gibraltar. Um, yeah. 
yeah, if they're going off, they're going to go elsewhere in the world, and he's going to be left to deal with, you know, what's his name, Sahib? Sahib. He deals yes. with Sahib and the rebels and everything. Like I said, he becomes a local concern, whereas the Archangel and crew are a... What would you consider it? They're not global. Because conce conceivably they could be more than global. Yeah. But are we, like, on a four-point system here, in which case we're just Earth orbit? Or are we solar system-wide? I would put it solar system. I don't know. We don't see... We don't see where um, the space bases are. Like, we know... Um... Oh, God, what was... Bloody Valentine took place at... We don't know. Well, no, we do know. No, wasn't it around Earth? No, no, no. It, what was the name of the place? Uh, that I'm not going to remember. Oh, God. It's, uh, it's in my head and I can't... Hold on. I'm just going to do a quick search of my notepad and see if I ever wrote down... Let's see. The word bloody. Episode 7. Bloody Valentine tragedy. Blood, whole war. Heliopolis. Blah, blah, blah. Nope. Uh, moral high ground. Pulling a bloody Valentine on Earth. I suppose they could still clutch to it. Oh, it seems like this would have been the paragraph I would have written down. Nope. <laughs> Not there either. Bloody Valentine tragedy. Destruction of a space colony by Earth forces. Didn't write it there. That would have been a great place. Nope. Damn it. Why anyway. would you write it there? Well, this is actually right where I was writing all my original thoughts as they were coming up. Uh, you know, Zodiac Alliance of Freedom Treaty equals Zaft. CE equals a Cosmic Era. Current year CE 70. All my little Earth versus plants where I, when I didn't know what the fuck a plant was. It was just Earth versus plants. I even have a, a line here that says plants equals blank because I don't know what plants were. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I don't remember the name of the place, but yeah, my point was that it was so close to Earth that its um, remnants are basically in Earth orbit, implying that the colonies might not be that far away from Earth. Um, because multiple different Gundams have done different things where various distances. I think Gundam 00 goes as far out as Jupiter at the most. Which from Mercury does the entire solar system. A bunch of Gundams do just, um, what's it called? The four uh, positions around Earth orbit that you could put geosynchronous things. Oh, jeez, hold on. It's not geosynchronous, it's... I know what? it's not geosynchronous, but I know what you're talking Lagrange about. Lagrange points. They yes. they only deal with the four Lagrange points that you could have a object in Earth proximity and still stick around the Earth as it travels around the sun, sun around the sol uh, galaxy, etc. Um, so I don't know if what one of these could be. The fact that George went out into the solar system and then set stuff up in our little backstory segment does not inform me if that was like Okay, this is for the Gundam fans out there. Maybe not specifically you, Justin. Gundam 00, we have an exploration ship that goes out and we find its wreckage around Jupiter. And that's expounded upon in the movie, why it's there, I guess. But um, George goes out into the solar system and does he set up colonies out there? We don't know. Gundam 00, they go out to Jupiter Human civilization is still all around Earth. So just because we have stuff out there doesn't mean it's out all out there. Got it. Anyway, I don't even remember why that was a point. Oh, because of Dacosta. Like I said, Dacosta yeah. might just be regional, whereas the Archangel could just be global or Lagrange point wide. I don't even know if that's a word. Or not even a word, um, concept. Um, otherwise, the only other additions here are Navy and Okpe. Got it. Oh. 
And right to the rest of the comments then. Trying to zoom out here so everything is on the thing. Uh, I think Rao is up to something. He's taking pills, and obviously, like, he's, uh, obviously seems like he's in a bad way whenever we see him taking them. Uh, then goes to lengths to hide how bad off he is. Obviously, something is going on there, but I can't figure it out. The only real clue so far is that he called Zala conceited when he hung up the phone and gave a smirk to himself implying that the guy he's working closely with isn't really his ally. I'd agree with that. I I think it's I think it's a medical thing. I think his body's deteriorating or he has some pro medical problem. So you think he's taking pills because it's a medical thing. Yes. Got it. What what I mean by that is I don't think it's like an addiction thing. I don't think it's like a habit, I think it's causing him, I think it's because of pain, because of something he's going through. Got it. Uh, I guess of a slighter note, in On a Calm Day, when Atherin leaves Lacus's place, Mr. Pink jumps up and tells Lacus that there is a problem. Uh, no clue if that is a serious note or not. We know Mr. Pink is the Haru that unlocks doors for Lacus. But it's also the one that constantly has said there is no problem. Not sure if it's an alert device for Lacus, and this is a sign that something is about to happen or not. I think that's highly possible. Well, we also know that Kira made all the Harus, so I don't know why Mr. Pink would jump up and say there's a problem after Kira leaves. Yeah, I think... the. Because the alert device makes way too much sense. As I said, I've got no idea. Does. Let's see. With Waltfield, I guess we also got some insight into opinion on Rao from other military officers. He goes out of his way to indicate that he never liked Rao, and by virtue, anyone from his team is automatically considered uh, much lesser in his eyes. Uh, Waltfield also mentions that Yezik's scar could be surgically removed, and that he's only—I'm uh, sorry—that he's only keeping it to remind himself of how Kira humiliated him. Uh, that's added context, since one could just have as easily assumed that it was a permanent scar that Yezik had no control over. That he is willfully clinging to it is a whole other matter. That is a a sign that he still needs to get needs to pay Kira back. Well, I mean, we know that's what he's all about. He yells yep. about it all the time. Something of note, but the Archangel has something called Lohengrin cannons. Uh, Ramus refused to use them last battle due to the fact that they risked contamination of the planet. No further information is given on the matter, but we know that we used them in space before. So good to know that they have a weapon which poisons the well, essentially, of any place that they use it. Yeah. It could it could also be the reaction with oxygen and stuff like that, but that's still a problematic weapon. Uh, so Elsman complains about the dissipation effect on the beams that he's firing during the battle. He and Yazik are considered elite at the moment, and yet Kira compensated for the dissipation effect almost immediately in his first fight in the desert. Uh, Waltfield commented on it and suggested that he might actually be one of their elites for how quickly he could adapt to new situations in battle. Just a quick comparison of supposed elites. It could also be a case where there is ranks within, within elite or people who have like different standards for what elite should be. So that's 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 what I was trying to indicate. That Yazik and his crew are considered elites, but Waltfield is saying that Kira could be an elite because due to the thing that Kira is doing, that the current elites are not doing. Yes. 
All right, last uh, last note here. Just a note on battles and protagonist plot armor. I feel like I would be a lot more invested in fights if the good guys took a comparable amount of damage as the bad guys did. Make it look like the bad guys even have a chance. The Archangel is constantly outnumbered and getting slammed, and the most it ever suffers is some scuffed paint, and sometimes a console will uh, short-circuit. Consoles exploding is a Star Trek thing. Makes it look like you took damage without actually having to damage your ship model. I just feel like it would be I'd be more invested in the good guys if I thought there was a chance they could lose in any given battle. But they win every fight without even needing to uh, comment on needing repairs. That's just my two cents. I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, that's all my thoughts. Anything you've got uh, continuing in to the next episode? No. No, uh, we're we're very much at a point where we're doing a bit of a reset on what the, on who the antagonistic force is going to be. Well, certainly so. a geographical reset. Exactly. You know, we went from Heliopolis, which was what like three episodes worth of fighting and determining what the scene is, to the Runaway, or I guess technically to say um, the Artemis, which was like one. <laughs> Was it one episode or two episodes? I want to say it was one. Two. Well, either way, that was just those guys, and then the runaway, which is like all the way up to Earth orbit, where we're dealing with you know remnants of uh, not remnants, uh, just a couple of Earth ships here and there. Um, yeah. the two different captains chasing after them from Zaft side, Lacus and gang. And then we go to the planet, and then we have the desert thing that we just kind of finished, assuming that we're not still in the desert in this episode. Yeah. Which I don't think we are, because I think this episode's called Sea Died Red, something like that. Yes. Well, yeah, because I made the comment last time that Gundam always has at least one underwater fight. It makes sense. It would be a very tactical choice to to, to f- fight underwater when most suits wouldn't be designed for it. Right. Well, I, I think that's what I what I really meant is that there's always, I guess, except with the exception of maybe Gundam Wing, which had two different out uh, uh mobile suits designed for underwater. There's always just like one in most other Gundams that's designed for underwater. Because you know, thinking about it, despite the fact that. Space is obviously far more encompassing when it comes to a location to fight in. That when it comes to the planet Earth, we are majority water. You'd think there would be. But I guess it's also the fact that we don't have, like, domed cities underwater or anything. You're muted. Still? Thank you. It's very much the idea that these are the pinnacle of machinery. So, how do you set yourself apart when you are the pinnacle? You have to find those subtle little things you can do, and if you can make it so you can pop in water, pop back out, that's a big deal. Um, I don't think I ever mentioned this to you before, because I think it only came up back when me and Griff originally were going to start watching Mobile Suit Gundam Origin, um, there is the location of Mobile, uh, Gundam Headquarters in Japan, where previously the only moving life-size model uh, Gundam existed. Yep. Um, and on the inside of the building nearby, there was like a, not a poster, but just like a giant note written by the creator of Gundam, Tomino. Um, about how they wanted to create a life-size Gundam to be put on display that could really move and walk. But all their research, they found it was impossible. You can't do it because a real life-size Gundam wouldn't be able to walk in Earth gravity. So Gundams are actually designed for space. Uh, in the designing of the show, I mean. Uh, Gundams it. are designed for space, and 
it's kind of an apology slash explanation about the outside Gundam, which is, you know, tied to a giant moving contraption to be able to move, about the fact that Gundams aren't supposed to really work in Earth environment, but it was a conceit of the writing of the show that Gundams constantly had to be put on Earth. Yeah. That's... I, yeah, I just looked up the life-size Gundam. That's so big. Well, which one are you looking at? Because there are a number of them. Uh, there I just was... looked up life-size Gundam. Well, yeah, but I mean, well, there again, there are a number of them. Uh, three, I think the RS, the RX seventy-eight, the original one, uh, had a full life-size one, and then they replaced that with a Gundam Unicorn one in the same location. But the Gundam HQ... Are you looking at one that has, like, a whole metal substructure behind it? Uh, I saw that. I saw a couple other ones. I'm just going through images. Oh, because the metal substructure one behind it is the one that's Gundam HQ. Got it. Because that one has, like I said, it has, like, a building next to it where you see all this other Gundam shit and, like, notes from the uh, creators and whatnot. Also, Ooh. buy all the Gundam shit you could ever want. Um, but yeah. Because all of the move... But, like, the uh, the one with the substructure behind it's the one that, like, it sits down, it stands up, it walks forwards, and does all that stuff. Because, again, it's got this whole structure built around it that allows it to do it. All the other ones, I think, like, do, like, Mr. Roboto. They only move the upper torso and arms. Got it. Um, but, yeah. Uh, that everything? Uh, yeah, that's it. All right, well, let's go ahead and get into it, then. The note. I really don't know why they interrupted the scene of it going through the valley. Just to say, we're going to the sea. That sea's clearly not red. Or very well animated. Oh god, no. They CGI'd the sea, it feels like. Oh, size back on. Uh, this has been a week. No, that wasn't Sai. Was that Sai? Um, for what? So the person the camera just focused on a little while ago. Yes, it was Sai. Remember, Sai had like a, a week of solitary confinement. You're right. Yeah. She looks like she's going through it. Why is Birdie in there? Oh, it's probably his room. Never mind. Was she always holding his jacket in the opening? Um... I'm not sure. I only just noticed it. But I don't think this is the kind of show that does micro changes to the opening either. Because this seems like the same opening, so I'm going to go with a yes. So I don't remember Psy being next to Flay there in that part of the opening either. I So I, I remember Psy being next to Flay there. I guess maybe I just paid attention to the naked girl in the background too much. So I also don't remember the flash of the underwater scene neither, in the opening no, either. This, this, is, this is a slightly different opening. So you make comments like that, and the first thing that people are going to say is, no, it's the same as always. Yeah, just fucking blind. It's yeah. totally possible. I don't remember those two being in that scene either, but, you know... It's entirely possible I just stare blankly at the opening and don't pay attention. We do also have the obligation to talk over it completely, so it's Indeed. entirely possible I focus more. They're over the ocean here. I don't think this the... was... This is different. They were in space before. Yeah. No, that's that, that was different. I 
Also, why'd you take them with you? This might be a slight flashback. I don't know if they took it. Has them to be. They're at their control center still. The realest thing I've seen in an anime. Taking a drink and it goes down the wrong tube. Oh, I assumed that she was good with alcohol sort of thing. I like that they put this in here. No, Stein's dead. He's never coming back for season two of Furin. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, never mind. That's Stein. That's Stein. Ooh, we're safe. Yeah. That's right. The most respectful thing I could have done right now was make a joke during your prayers for the dead. <laughs> well, I'm also a pretty good pilot, as I proved during last episode. Yeah. What do you think, Rambo? Help from a goddess? Well, I'm sorry. That statement confused me. It's a translation thing. It has to be. Welcome to the elevator music. Have you ever been on Earth Sea? You're from Heliopolis. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. Remember, a lot of these people were really confused by gravity. So. Yeah. Fish would get nowhere near as close to that ship as they are. What direction did you go? We went to the northwest. We were heading towards Gibraltar, I thought. And then we're in the Indian Ocean. So maybe they got into Gibraltar into the Indian Ocean, which... Technically, it could do... But, I mean, why? We do know that it was mountains that they would have to have crossed if they went the other direction, but... Like, if we're going Egypt to Alaska by way of the Indian Ocean. It, what is going on? Yeah. Oh, remember last episode we ended with uh, Kira crying. I didn't want to kill him. Yeah. I'm disappointed. <laughs> I mean, Waltfield was be, like being developed to be this real interesting character. And I feel like we really only got two episodes with him, even though we spent, like, more time when he was, like, brewing coffee and shit. I agree with you. I, mean, I want to see more Waltfield, less Rao. I don't give it. I know I've been had myself drawn as Rao. But Waltfield is my dude. I think Rao could secretly become a good guy. Yeah, maybe the drugs make him bad. 
They're, they're bad drugs, that's what it is. Well, remember, Dr. Jekyll was a doctor. No, oh, you would have heard it. No, it was everyone, raining. Everyone would have heard it if I was crying. <laughs> it was raining. Okay, it was raining just over me. Come on, man. You know what to do. I don't know. Flea has taught him really weird things about what should happen right now. There, there, never mind. Spe speaking of the teacher of weird things. What I'm saying is weird is manipulating him hard, so. Okay. So that's a good moment, though. Absolutely. Right, the play, the part where he called the place that they're fighting and dying for a really shit place that you shouldn't die for. Yep. If you recall, I suppose that Kagili was a uh, coordinator as well. It's yet to be confirmed, though. No, yeah, no, I, just, I supposed it. I didn't say she was. Yeah. I think she is. So Based on the episode one stuff that I said before. Yeah. I think they're both first generation coordinators. That's a step too far for me. I don't know anything about her backstory to be able to guess that if her parents are naturals or not. In fact, actually... Based on my argument about her being a coordinator, based on episode one stuff, I guess I would think she would not be a, a genera first generation natural. She would have to be at least a second generation. Because remember, I, my thought was that her, she called her dad a traitor, implying that her dad would be in Zaft. So my thought would then have to be that her dad was a coordinator. Make her at least second yeah. generation. Thank God we already got that George episode, so we already know this. Gotta impress this boy! Like I said, she's manipulating him in a very specific way. So that yes. he's come to acknowledge hugs and comfort to mean a lead up to sexualization. So Yes. Oh, she's like, yeah, that's right. That's not the face that I read there. The face that I read looked like she was fearful of losing Kira, not... Oh, she is. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the but... face she was making. It wasn't a confident, aha, I beat you face. No, internally, she's like, yeah, get out of here. Be? Spit break. 
That's split break. Okay, god damn, that text was hard to read back to a couple episodes ago. ふっ、<laughs> For whatever reason, it seems to be out here. Shouldn't the neutron things that are in the, the planet's crust be jamming radar anyway? Yes. Are those the same type? Nope. I was saying, are they the same type that Gibraltar gave Vault Field for the final battle? It's like, no, this is a different name. Goons. <laughs> we finally pulled out the goons. Din, which are different from Jin's, which we saw in the first episode. Does stand for diving? I don't think so. I think they have the, uh, I think the goons are the diving ones. Got it. Because the Zap guys were saying about launching the goons. These guys haven't even yeah. acknowledged there are anything other than things in the air. And I don't know what the abbreviations are, if there even are ones for the Zap level suits. It's kind of funny to consider one of the first things we uh, indicated towards uh, Little Suit Gundam Origin was that it shows yeah. that the mobile suits are superior to like jets and stuff because we see them like they drop kick a jet mid flight. <laughs> And here, we're constantly yeah. throwing out jets and shit against mobile suits. Yeah, like, realistically, sending the jets out would kind of be being like, fuck, you're we're most likely going in. I don't know, they're, they're showing to me they're still effective in Gundam Seed, whereas original Gundam, apparently not. Which doesn't make sense to me either way, because it doesn't look like the mobile suits are as fast as a jet. And realistically, you know, you can fire a rocket, I mean, or a missile from beyond the horizon. I mean, there's reasons in original Gundam why that's not the case, but be spoilers to say, the show will tell you. Those reasons don't seem to exist here. Oh. One, if we didn't oh, CGI the water. But <laughs> two, if Flay also yeah. fell off the boat. It'd be great if Flay just fell off. Just kill Flay off right here? No, no, no. Like a rescuer or something. You know, just, I don't know. I just want to see bad things happen to Flay. I'm a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, because they're getting, they're, they're getting real messed up by those, uh, they're going to have to re reapply paint. 
Go back to comments. I mean, it's that Futurama joke, right? Planning spare ships sinking in the ocean. How many atmospheres can we take? Well, it's a spaceship, so anywhere between zero and one. The Archangel really should have depth charges. Not because of the ocean, but need them. well, depth charges would seem like they'd be useful in space too. They're really just floating explosives that you launch in a direction. Yeah, I. It seems like there'd be more that more of a hindrance. By the way, I want to point out, due to all of your hate on the dagger thing. From the very beginning, that one Waltfield yeah. got killed by the dagger because it was an effective weapon when he ran out of power. And now we just killed more shit with the dagger. The dagger has a building kill count now. That's fine. It's not the main weapon, but so I support it. I know it's just funny to think how adamant you were against it in the very beginning. I think it made more sense last episode when they killed Wallfield with it. Because again, it was the, the Gundam running out of power, so it had no ability to like fire a gun or pull out the yeah. sword or anything. Well, oh, never mind, forget the dagger. Not worth it anymore. <laughs> it's at the bottom of the ocean now. How are you gonna pull this one off? Oh, somebody else's gun. Same thing you do in a video game. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't like the fact that the strike was able to fully function underwater. I mean, technically, it's kind of not. It's kind of being pushed around by the goons, and the goons have the underwater mobility, so... If they didn't yeah. keep getting up into melee with it, I don't feel like the strike would be. Oh, thank you, Survey. will the once PTSD be yours, of Simba. The show. It's all right. I'm a main character. I'm not gonna for die for a while. Technically, he's the character we focus on the least amongst all the elites. Oh, except for that other guy, the guy who was with Yasik last episode. Yeah. I think Atherin's about to lose a friend. Yeah. Yeah, that's the vibe I'm getting as well. Although I don't know, I'm double I'm doubling back on that now because for in order for that guy to be killed, we'd also have to lose a Gundam. It's giving me the narrative vibe of these two are being too friendly all of a sudden. One of them is going to die. But that is yep. the pilot of a Gundam, which means we also have to be losing one of the very few Gundams that we have. Now, does this choose more Gundams at some point? Uh, once again, you're in as far as I am. So, <laughs> I don't... Uh, this isn't a show I've seen before. Because if we were to lose him, that would give more reason for revenge for the for Scarboy. I don't know. Yasik has argued with him before too. He's like the um, he's like the therapist, the, the middleman, though. though. 
Well, John, I just mean that Yaz I don't think Yazik would care if any of these people died. Yazik like throws. I think Yazik has thrown him against a wall before. But if we're going off of this idea, what if y their last interim was conflict? It would be kind of funny if Kigali kills Athrun. We just saw them in a shootout on the beach. I could see it. I could see it. Well, I just mean that obviously Kira isn't going to kill Atherin. So it would be kind of funny if Atherin... I don't think Atherin's going to die, but it'd be funny... To, okay. I'm just... Sorry, my brain just entered into commenter mode, where commenters always take when I say something would be funny and take it... Why do you always think it'd be funny if somebody fucking died? You know, they hit me with that weird tangent. It would be funny to me as a viewer of the show who's enjoying this as a non-reality if one character tied to our main character shot and killed that character's best friend just thinking that they're killing another Zaf soldier because there's no fucking way Kigali knows who the fuck uh, Atherin is. It would be just one yes. of those weird coincidences that you Kigali would have no reason even think to mention to anybody other than I killed a Zaf soldier. One of the many Zaft soldiers I've killed in my life as a rebel against the Zaft. Okay, so if we're going down this line of thinking, right? That if Kigali killed Athrin, that would give reason for a wedge to be put between her and Kira. It would also give a reason for Lachis to return to the story. Because she could be vengeful against Kira, which could eventually lead to the realize it them talking and like I didn't kill him. I um, feel sad about it too, then the that starts to be a thing. Well I mean Lacus is in the story. She's not out of it. I mean like to drag her into the conflict. I mean she kind of is already. And not like from the other side, the uh, political mechanizations of Zala versus Klein kind of mm -hmm. already has her in that, especially if you consider that they're the tying mechanism between the two. You know, mm -hmm. um, Lacus is Klein's kid, and Athrin is a Zala, uh, Zala's kid, so they're already the connected Indeed. tissue between the two political rivals at the head, because remember, Klein is the chairman of uh, the Supreme Council of Zaf, who is opposed by uh, Zala, who Rao says is going to probably be the next chairman. The magazine that you missed that said Klein is leader. Yes. Like, I think it's... So, do I think Atherin will die? No. Is it possible? No, probably not either. Yes. He's kind of the secondary lead. And everybody around here's got plot armor, so long as you're written or <laughs> as a protagonist. He or he will be killed, a.k.a. heavily injured, secretly alive and recovering. I don't think anybody in our main cast that hasn't been introduced in the last three episodes is going to die for... I don't know. I, I would spitball a number out, but I don't think they're going to die anytime soon. And obviously, mm -hmm. if I said over like 10 episodes, that's like more than an arc. So I don't I don't want to guess that nobody's going to die by the end of an arc. Something could drastically change and say the next few episodes to then start a new arc based I think we're losing green hair. It. Probably, because it was never a natural hair color, so. True. There was no natural uh, way to segue into a joke, so... 
Hey, no, no. That, that was a also, very good segue. His dad doesn't have green hair, so technically he's only getting it from 50% of his genes. It's true, so really it's going to start to fade, is what you're saying. That or not be, um, you know, um, yeah, I don't know what you call it. You know, same with eye color. What is it? Uh, Inherited. Dominant gene? It might not be a dominant gene yes. passed down. Although technically, I don't, I don't, I don't want to sound um, sexist when I say this because I just don't know. This is just me not knowing ignorance on my behalf. Isn't it technically yep. typically uh, the genes passed down by your mother have the greater chance of non of being non dominant? It depends on what. Because I, I know for hair in general. You typically want to look at your mother's father. Because you would think that it would be dominantly um, the... Sorry, I can't think of the uh, the scientific word for women. <laughs> you know? Uh, well, no, no. Because, you know, uh, gen- in genetics, there is, like, masculine and feminine. or well, That's yeah. actually... That's, term- that's uh, language, not uh, genetics. But I, you would think, given that the human body is created and, you know, and uh, nurtured in the womb, right, that the predominant factor of anything should be the female genetics, because that's where everything is coming from. The other half is just no, yeah. a donation of genetics that's inherited then by the egg. So... And then the egg is then all the mothers. So I don't know the specific details or the science behind it, but I do know that specifically qualities of hair a lot of the time are de- sort of determined by the mother's father. Which that then is, is what I was saying true. before, though. That's the, the male-dominant genes. So it's male-dominant, but from mother's side. But at least that follows through on the female genes being more expressed. It just happens to be expressed from the father's side, which is a weird thing. Again, my concept here is that the egg is the receptacle and that the sperm is then the genetic injection of more information. So you would think that the existing information would be dominant and that the added information would ha- be have the higher chance of being um, God, I hate it when I know the words. My brain is just getting worse and worse with age. Recessive. That the um, that the injected information would have the higher chance of being recessive versus the information that was original. Apparently it's equal. Well, you know, genetics is weird, I guess. My problem is, is that I think I'm uh, when I say what feels right, I come at things with the ignorance and wonder of a flat earther. You know, someone who says, yes. "You know, I was standing on the hill, and I thought I could see the city across the bay, and I know that the Earth, according to these round earthers, is that the Earth I should only be able to see six miles to the horizon." But that city over there is 30 miles away, so how can I see it? Yeah, I called you. Called your bluff, round earthers. And it's like, well, that is the observation of somebody who's using observational science, which is fine. And just trying to put things into a logical perspective and not knowing all the information, right? So somebody else will come along and say, yeah, but you're actually standing on a hill which elevates you above a uh, sea level, which then extends your sight radius beyond six miles, so you're seeing the tops of the buildings and blah 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 blah. Sorry, I get a lot of uh, flat yeah. Earth uh, shit in my sh- uh, YouTube shorts for some reason, or not flat Earth shit. People responding against flat Earth or shit. So I just constantly feel that way that when I make an observation, scientifically minded, that while it sounds logical. I'm coming at it with the ignorance of not knowing the shit that I don't know <laughs> that really sounds stupid to everybody else that actually knows what's going on. Got it. Like if I walked into your kitchen and start telling you about all the shit that I like putting on food, so we just put it all together, obviously, everything that I like put in one pot, 
is going to make something that I like. You know, kind of like if I took spaghetti and Reese peanut butter cups and ice cream and roast chicken and <laughs> put it all in one pot together. Chocolate and chicken, no. I'm just saying, it obviously you've got like food theory and you know how certain things yes. cook well together. You've got knowledge. And if I said something like, I know how stuff tastes, like stupid shit that I've said to you before. <laughs> and and I just tried to apply that to kitchen science, then obviously I fucking know nothing. My ignorance would fuck everything up in the kitchen. <laughs> and you, somebody who already knows, could say, that wouldn't work, and here's why. Yeah, no. It's entirely possible. So that's why I think, when I talk about genetics, right, and I think, what did I hear about back when I was in high school learning biology? And try to even remember the slightest bit and say it out loud. I'm going to sound like an idiot to a 17-year-old who's still in school. It happens, though. Anyway, wide tangent. <laughs> Anything well, else about the episode? Tangents. Um? I mean, there was the whole Flay really. Kigali thing. Kigali, they're uh, there. Yeah. It's okay. It's all right. It just proves further of the level of manipulation. Well, he, I mean, he blushed, but I don't know if because he expected Kigali to go further the way Flay does. Or no, he, he was just uncomfortable it, with human touch. So it's... I've seen it a lot of times in dealing with people who are not only used to dealing with people who are very toxic. That is not at saying that Flay is or isn't toxic, even though I think she is. I mean, I think everyone agrees that Flay is toxic. I don't know anybody but who wouldn't be saying Flay is toxic. It's the idea that it does not matter if if you're used to dealing with people who just take advantage of you when someone's nice for the first time, you automatically assume you're being taken advantage of. And that was a moment where the guard was let down because of the situation. I don't know if the guard was let down, because the first time we've seen Kira with his guard let down, he breaks out crying, usually. But he However, was he already was... crying. Yeah, I was about to say, he was already crying. Doesn't mean you can't keep crying. He didn't have a reason to keep crying in that instance. What he had was someone who was there and was like, listen, I'm not going further than this. Like, I'm, I'm just patting your back and saying, I got you. I mean, we don't know. There's no reason that he would keep crying. Because literally the episode ended with him, like, Waltfield face in the distance still. So, Oh, of course. He's going to cry again. But it's such that it's that interaction where he sees a beauty someone who is clearly an attractive female who is not trying to manipulate him. Technically, technically, thinking about it, the first time Flay comes at him like this, he's crying, he stops crying, Flay hugs him, he starts crying again. Yes. And so it's just a very interesting... It, it, it's just a case of mirrors. That's all it is. It, it's a mirror to someone who's doing it without trying to take advantage of him. She sees somebody in pain and just wants to help. I mean, we're giving her the benefit of the doubt. She could be trying to manipulate him, too. We don't... We just don't know. Absolutely not. She's here for... From everything we've seen, there's zero evidence of manipulation. Oh, oh did you forget already where she was super concerned about the fact that the Gundam was here, the Gundam she was following since episode one, when she said her father was, might have been a traitor? And that she was actually upset that he was the pilot for because she was going after it. And then yeah. he pushed her away and then he took it from her. And then she has a little bit of suspicion about him for the fact that he shoved her away and took the thing that she was there for. There is sub-motivating factors here which could imply that she's up to no good as well. We just She's kept a very hard cover. Also the fact she's walking around with Rambo all the time. Again, so... Uh... That like the future information could change the circumstances, but from everything I have seen, 
it is I don't think she is in this for for a negative circumstance. What if she's a better flay? Good job. That's what I'm saying. You're you're saying you're not seeing it, but I literally just threw out all these sub motivating factors, which if you didn't see her, right? Mm -hmm. If you if I just like sat down to you one day and said, Hey, let me tell you about this person and you didn't see how innocent she looked when she was doing it, it'd be really easy to take all these factors and say like if we were playing D D, right? And obviously you don't see the animated person. I'm just describing to you what the characters are doing. In the yeah. back of your head, you'd have to be thinking, this person's going to stab me in the back at some point. I'm going to keep my guard up just a little bit all the time. Yes. Because you could empathize with what they might be up to. If you can understand what they're up to, you could understand why they might do something at a later point. You can, but all the evidence we have seen from Kigali is that she is trying to do what's right for her people. I will say, I do believe that Kigali is not going to do a heel turn out of nowhere. I just think... Mm -hmm. Again, I just think that you could describe it in such a way that she could. Oh, I'm not disputing that. I think it's absolutely possible that she can, and it, and it, could, and it could happen for any reason. And obviously, as I've said before, I don't know the future of the show. I'm just as far in it as you are, so... I'm not making these guesses or bets based on anything other than literally episode one. Literally the episode we met her in and then she showed up 15 episodes later. So, And we have no idea what she's been up to since then. She literally escaped Heliopolis, saw her in the desert. Yeah, I, so I think there, there's going to be a point where Kigali and Kira are going to come into conflict. But it's going to be because she is going to try and get him out of Flay's manipul the cycle of Flay's ma manipulation, and he's not going to handle that well. I don't know that she cares. I don't think she cares yet. I think if there's going to be a conflict there, it's going to be Flay coming at Kigali. So that's why she's going to end up caring. Because Flay is going to be threatened by Kigali. And then Kigali is going to see what's happening and then handle it and, that, and then have a response. That's not a good matchup. Uh, you know, rebel hardened uh, fighter pilot Kigali versus trash pickup? Flay? <laughs> what's but Flay you know do? <laughs> but, do, but do you know what is the matchup? Kigali versus Kira. Ah, well, and I mean... Flay is manipulating. Maybe and if Kigali be turns to out reveal, to be a coordinator. That could be a way to do the coordinator reveal. I thought you were going to go with backstabbing Flay versus... Because, you know, Flay manipulating the crew against Kigali, or, I don't even physically attacking her from behind. Because I, I don't Kigali know if she can is, manipulate the crew. Nobody is really against Flay on the crew. Um, yeah, I, and, I see it. And Kigali is not great with people. So it seems like real easy to get Kigali into a situation she doesn't understand or doesn't anticipate. Flay is real good about spreading rumors. Yeah. I mean, just think about when Lachis, Lachis was on the ship. All she did was hang out in the cafeteria talking about coordinators and what they could be up to when everyone was like, oh, shit, she's right, you know? I think the problem There's is, is that the only... There's too many possibilities to actually distinctly say. Well, the thing is that the only people that don't like Flay are outside of the show. So <laughs> everybody in the show is like, oh, man, Flay lost her parents, you know? Everyone, except for Psy. Except for, <laughs> Psy is obviously like, oh man, what the fuck's going on here? Everyone else is like, man, that flay Psy relationship thing is weird, but I feel bad for Flay because her dad died literally on screen. But I think eventually the fact that her dad died is going to stop being able to be an excuse. 
Well, I mean, again, think about it. Flay isn't doing anything that requires an excuse. People are like, it, it's weird her relationship with Kira when she's like picking up the trash around his cockpit, but it, no one's like, hmm, Flay's up to something, you know? Except for Psy. Again, Psy is the exception to this rule. There's got to be a point where 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 some where the where it breaks. There's got to be a point where it's seen that something's up. Well, I mean, because even her manipulations don't play out or don't don't appear to be anything. Like from an outside perspective, who's to say she's just not in a relationship with Kira? And at most, we can say you're too young to be sexually active. I don't even know how old she is. Yeah. The things we would call her out for, from an outside perspective, don't actually make much sense to call her out for in the show. Like, if this was some sort of weird isekai where I got sent to the Gundam Seed universe and I'm wandering down the hall wearing a, a uniform or something, what would I actually call Flay out for? <laughs> like... If my whole purpose was to enter the world of Gundam Seed, and I'm going to put an end to Flay right now, and I'm walking down the hall, what could I say? I, th I think there... I think you could absolutely call her out for the social behavior if you were within that circle. But remember, the circle is high-strung uh, teenagers. So, what am I going to... I'm going to do the same thing Psy does, try to talk to somebody, get my arm busted behind my back. No, absolutely not. I can't what believe I'm be. getting my ass kicked by a 15-year-old kid. What it would be would be mentioning it to somebody within the circle and then having a female talk to Flay, being like, hey, what the, what's this? Like, you're clearly, like, what, what's happening here? Oh god, this is it would turn it into nine oh two one oh. It would Melrose Place. Oh absolutely it would. Yeah, but I don't think anything would be accomplished. It would just be more you know, someone goes to talk to Flay, Flay gets upset, walks off, talks to it Kira, would be Kira more productive then productive than nothing. No, no, it would be sigh all over again. It would just be we would send one of the uh, the girls on the team to go talk to it. Uh then Flay would run to Kira for help. Kira would be stop talking to her. I don't think Kira would I don't know. I don't know that people in this world have that don't hit girls mentality. He literally slapped Kigali right out of the blue for no reason. So I think this yeah. would just turn into a female size situation. We've seen Flay's playbook. Fair enough. And Kai, uh, Kai, Kira is the main character, which means can't touch him unless he wants you to touch him. Yeah, no, fair enough. I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, 17 tangents down the road, I think it's uh, time to call an end to this one. Indeed. All right. Well, once again, I've been Theta. This has been Justin. This has been Stoneface Reactions. And we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hey everybody, thanks for watching another Stoneface Reactions. If you have an idea of another video we could go ahead and watch, go ahead and put it in the comments down below and we'll add it to the wheel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let us know what you thought about this video and what parts you liked. And until then, we'll see you next time. Is this too goofy?